Hello, I'm here with Bill Mitchell, who is a professor of economics at the University of Newcastle. Bill, it's great to have you with me this morning. My pleasure. Uh, full disclosure, uh, Bill is a friend of mine, um, and I would consider him an intellectual mentor, so um, I, this won't be exactly uh, the, the, the tough Mike Walls type 60 minutes type questions. But I, I wanted you on because um, you are considered one of the leading proponents of so-called modern monetary theory. In fact, I believe that you each even coined the name, um, and it seems to have caught on in the, in the blogosphere. Do you want to just outline some of the basic principles uh, for the audience? Mm. Well, modern monetary theory is a, um, a collection of ideas. It starts off with what I call the basic rules of macroeconomics that seem to have been lost uh, in more modern, you know, starting with the monetarists and then the, the more extreme versions of what I now call sort of uh, orthodox economics. And in what sense uh, have, have we, uh, has it lost sort of basic macroeconomic principles? Well, we seem to forget that uh, spending equals income. You know, for every, every dollar spent, it's somebody's income. And we seem to forget that if you uh, uh, don't spend, you won't have income. And then that, you know, the, the, the basic things that we're interested in, such as uh, prosperity, uh, uh, employment, and these things, they're intrinsically linked to spending. And, uh, you know, so we have these far-fetched ideas now coming out of the orthodoxy of, of uh, uh, so-called fiscal contraction expansions. This, this weird idea that you, you'll actually get an expansion in the economy if you cut spending. And that just violates what I call the basic rule. And of course, that's been evident in places. That, uh, Europe has been the most uh, vivid illustration, but you saw it in, in, in Japan in the, the mid-1990s when they introduced ha higher taxes. Uh, 1997, we yeah. saw it. The, 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 the story rewrites itself. We saw it in the 1930s, and then we saw it in 1997 in Japan. The pressure get, you know, the government does the responsible thing and expands its net spending. It means it spends more than the, the the economic activity generates back in taxes, and uh, then the Conservatives uh, uh, mount their, their campaign against that because in intrinsically they hate the idea of government involvement in the economy unless it's serving their special interests and delivering what economists call rents to them. But, you know, so the pressure mounted and uh, and J Japanese government in 1997, yeah, increased the sales tax, and the, and the, the economy, which started growing quite nicely again, uh, and, and bringing down that little nudge up in unemployment, it, it went backwards again. It took them five years to recover. So you know, we've seen this, and we're seeing it in Europe, as you say. And and, and it, it seems to be driven by this idea of so-called fiscal sustainability that there is a level of public debt beyond which you can't go. And uh, at, at that stage, uh, governments can become bankrupt. Now, that may be the case in uh, countries uh, such as in the Eurozone, where they don't issue their own currency. But clearly, what you would describe as a sovereign uh, issuing uh, uh, currency uh, country, uh, that uh, type of a fiscal sustainability argument doesn't apply. Yeah, a basic starting point for modern monetary theory is that a, a government that issues its own currency, that has its own central bank, so it. it controls monetary policy, setting of interest rates, and uh, doesn't, inter doesn't sell any debt in a foreign currency, it can never go broke. The idea that it can never run out of money, I mean, you know, we've seen these dramatic statements. The US president a few years ago said the US is running out of money. In my country, the budget's just coming up and the treasurer is saying, we have run out of money. Well, that's impossible. The, a government of that persuasion, with those characteristics, can never run out of money. And you know, that's juxtaposed, as you say, against, say, Greece or Germany, who surrendered their currency sovereignty and gave, gave it to the European Central Bank. And they can run out of money because they've gone back to the old pre-1971 fixed exchange rate system where they have to cover their spending beyond tax revenue with uh, sale of debt and so the, the bond markets can retaliate against that sort of government. And in fact it, it goes back to, uh, I mean when, when you talk about basic macroeconomic principles and fiscal sustainability, a lot of this goes back to what I would describe as gold standard type thinking because it's obviously predicated on a notion, an, an old gold standard which we used to have, which did actually limit the stock of money that we had even in, in, in countries which issued their own currency uh, and, and until the 1930s for example. Yeah, because they tied the they tied the currency to a, a another commodity, gold, and so they they 
they accepted voluntary rules where they would have these rigid relationships between the amount of their own currency on issue and the stock of gold that their central bank had at any point in time. And so that was a voluntary constraint. And under that system of voluntary constraints, what followed then was that if it wanted to, to expand uh, uh, spending, uh, the, the volume of money was linked to the stock of gold, so the only way the government could expand spending if it reduced the spending in the private sector. Now, um, the argument that one often hears now is, okay, we've got fiat uh, currencies, uh, there is therefore no external constraint, so that what's to stop the government from printing money and uh, turning us into Weimar, Germany or Zimbabwe? You, you've written extensively about that and, and pointed out some very important differences, I think. Yeah, I think, you know, there's, there's a uh, a number of what I call myths that are layered on top of each other that, that appeal to people's intuition or their, their um, the popularisation of history, if you like, which is not the same thing as an understanding of history. And so there's these myths that are used to, to uh, perpetuate this ideological dislike for, for government intervention and government action in the economy. And, but they're paraded out as intrinsic truths that are, that are facts. And the uh, printing money myth is, is one of those. And uh, you know, there's, the, if you really understand what happened, say, in, in the Weimar era, uh, as part of after the Treaty of Versailles and the rest of it, if you understand what happened in uh, uh, Zimbabwe, you'll immediately appreciate that you know, in Zimbabwe, for example, Probably for good reason, Mugabe wanted to uh, uh, honour and reward the soldiers that, that led to the break with the British. But he went about it a very silly way by basically undermining his, the supply capacity of the economy, which was essentially the farming sector, and destroyed, you know, in a very short time, about 60% of your production capacity. Well, of course, if you keep spending and you can't produce goods to meet that spending, you'll get inflation. If you keep spending on top of that, you'll get hyperinflation. But that's such a such a, a weird circumstance. And, and, and you had a similar situation in, in, in Weimar, of course. So with, 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 with the, uh, you had about 25% of the industrial capacity of, of Germany uh, destroyed when the, the, the French occupied the Ruhr Valley, for yeah. example. And that's on top of the fact that you had a devastating war which probably destroyed another part of their productive capacity. Yeah. And then in addition to that, they were being forced to make payments the in reparations. foreign currency, yeah. reparations in gold. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Treaty of Versailles made them made ridiculous demands on them in, in nominal terms in the amount of money they had to give to the, the uh, Allies. The, uh, so they, they were forced by the treaty to expand the money supply out of any proportionality with the supply capacity of their economy. That's that's the, a major point. And the second major point is, yeah, the steel production um, was was devastated, and uh, so they lost their supply capacity. And w whenever we see hyperinflations, we typically see something extreme like that. And you know that's not remotely like a situation of a government like the U.S. or the Australian government uh, uh, picking up uh, unused capacity in the economy, unemployment, and uh, and firms with uh, out enough sales on their books, and uh, uh, increasing spending, uh, and you via the central bank basically ratifying that spending by crediting the bank accounts. And that's that that's perfectly reasonable approach. And I want to go back to something you were mentioning about the gold standard before just, you... Just, just to go finish ahead. that. Sure. What that, then in, what that then leads to, once you accept the fact that if there is idle capacity that can be brought it back into production and the government spends, well then the, what that leads to is the conclusion is, well, why do they issue debt? And uh, an important part of modern monetary theory is that it basically dispels the myth that a, what we now have identified as a sovereign government, a currency issuing government, should issue debt. The, you know, the issuing of uh, debt to the private bond markets is what I call just corporate welfare. And it's, it's most ironic. I mean, it basically gives them a risk-free asset to hedge their, hedge their uh, uncertainty and uh, store up their uncertainty in a safe asset. 
And you know, the, it creates wealth for the private sector. Well, it creates it, it alters the portfolio yeah. of the private sector. It gives them a, it gives, gives them, them a, some income. Effectively, it's like offering them a savings deposit as opposed to a flat. It, it's, exactly, it's exactly it's yeah. exactly that, and a, a guaranteed income flow and annuity each year. And you know, the, these the the bond market, the big wigs in the bond market are, are those that often lead the charge in the public debate about the need for so-called structural reform, and that is to you know eliminate unemployment, reduce unemployment benefits or income support for for the for the most disadvantaged citizens. Yet they're sitting on uh, a, a welfare pool supplied by a federal government of of a greater proportion, you know, many factors. Of the, the amount that gets given out in uh, income support to low low income groups, so it's sort of an irony. But what modern monetary theory emphasises is that that debt shouldn't be is not necessary to support the government spending. In fact, uh, spending does not crowd out private sector spending. Arguably, it crowds in private sector spending because, as you say, you've got a gap in, in, the, in the private sector savings. The, the private sector, maybe because of uncertainty, economic uncertainty, or because sales are not particularly robust, uh, has a predisposition to save. And if uh, someone else doesn't step in to uh, uh, offset that, then there is this output gap. Yeah, it comes back to your in initial um, mention of the concept of fiscal sustainability. We, we've become obsessed with these financial ratios of, of deficit to GDP ratios or uh, uh, outstanding debt to GDP. And we, we somehow have, we, we've defined various reference values, uh, as they call them, in the Stability and Growth Pact in Europe. And, you know, we've had uh, characters, uh, uh, professors of economics who, who can not handle a spreadsheet coming out as authorities defining these values. But those values are irrelevant to a currency issuing government. What a currency issuing government, the, the concept of fiscal sustainability for such a government is what, what the, it gets back to what fiscal policy is about. And fiscal policy should be about reducing that idle capacity that you've, you've been talking about. And so advancing what I call public purpose or, or, or well-being of the society. And that's defined in a number of ways. But uh, it will come down to you know provision of public service, provision uh, of enough spending to ensure there's enough employment, and provision of public infrastructure. Now, as long as the as long as the spending is buying those things, then it can't crowd out private spending. Uh, whereas once it gets to the the point where there are no things left to buy then you get a point of com much more competition emerging. And that's an important uh, issue because I think uh, there's a, a common caricature uh, to people who uh, oppose MMT. Uh, they, they suggest that you are um, totally insensitive to these inflationary concerns. But what you are suggesting is that there are constraints. They're not financial constraints, but they are real resource they're, constraints. They're real constraints. Uh, of course, look, all spending carries an inflation risk. It's not just government spending, it's, uh, it's net revenue from your external sector, so, so you, you, you trade account. If that's in surplus, that can have an inflation risk. Government spending can be, uh, have an inflation risk, and so can private consumption and investment spending. All spending carries an inflation risk. And, it's, and the, the, the concept of what are the limits on a government's fiscal position and I don't use the word budget because the budget is about households and the government isn't a household. So the government's fiscal position is limited by what it, what it can buy. A government, a currency issuing government can buy whatever's for sale in its own currency at any time. Now that's not the same thing as saying it should do that, but it can. And so the question is, well, how much should the government net spend, spend above its tax, tax revenue? And that depends upon what's available for sale and what, what, what the state of the private sector spending is. Now, I want to go back to a point you were making about the gold standard before, yeah. and you mentioned the buffer stock. Um, you have a very interesting idea that you've advocated for a number of years now, the so-called job guarantee program. Other people have called it a government as employer of last resort. But it turns the idea of a gold stock buffer into something different. You use employment effectively or employed people as a, or unemployed people as a buffer stock. Do you want to explain that a little bit further? Sure. Um... It goes back for me to 1978. I was sitting in an agricultural economics class in my fourth year at Melbourne University, and uh, uh, Australia at that time had a wool price stabilisation scheme, and uh, this was a sop to the uh, very powerful rural lobby, 
and rural lobbies, uh, lobbies are powerful everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, uh, no place more than in Europe, for example, which is a lot of the problem. But and uh, the the scheme worked by uh, to provide a guaranteed income to uh, to wool providers, so that uh, the the fluctuations of the wool cycle would wouldn't damage their annual incomes. So the government would step in and buy support the price of wool at a certain point. They'd agree. At, they'd agree at what price they would uh, they would support, and if the harvest was uh, was very good in one year. Uh, if the, you know the crop, the the, the, the what, what do they call them? The clip mm -hmm. was very good one year, and the, the market was uh, flooded with wool. Well, then the government would buy all that wool, and uh, because that would stabilise the price and, and stabilise the incomes of the farmers. Yeah, the income of the farmers would be stabilised. And uh, uh, in, around Australian cities, there were these big red brick buildings everywhere. Uh, with big warehouses, and they were the wool stores. And uh, you know, we used to go by in the car, and so and our parents would say, "That's the wool store." Mm. And uh, and and of course, when the uh, clip was poor, and uh, the mar uh, the government would sell the surplus, the stuff out of their wool wool right, store to prevent some kind of inflationary, yeah, inflationary and shorts. so to stabilise the price. And at that time, I wasn't very interested in uh, wool, but. Uh, um, unemployment was starting to rise in the late 70s uh, in Australia. Uh, the Australian government, like most of the Western governments, handled the first oil price shock very poorly and, uh, and unemployment rose from its full employment level for the first time. It's never got back there. But uh, at that time I was more concerned, that was the reason I was studying economics, because I was concerned about unemployment. And uh, I thought, well, this is a full employment of full employment of wool scheme, this price stabilisation scheme. It made sure that all wool would always be demanded. And of course, you know, a bit of lateral thinking then says that, well, the government can do that with uh, employment, so that if there's uh, idle, too much labour without a job, that is unemployment, the government can buy all that stock up and uh, at a fixed price. In, in effect, maintaining a, a, a stockpile of quote-unquote shovel-ready labour that can be drawn back into the private sector as the private sector transitions well, back. We've probably gone beyond shovels now in, <laughs> yes. in 2014, but uh, yeah, a stock of a pool of labour, the government can buy it. And, and uh, when the private sector resumes its strength after a downturn, then because it's been at a fixed price and you would set the, the price at the bottom of the private sector wage structure so you don't interfere with that, the, the private sector can then buy that labour back any time it wants if it, if, if it offers the right terms and conditions. And you know that overcomes a whole series of problems. Unemployment is the worst, worst evil or cost or whatever word you want to use that we can think of. The, 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 the modern economist is obsessed with what we call microeconomic inefficiencies. You know, structural reforms is all about minuscule little improvements in transport systems and what have you, but the, the cost, daily cost of unemployment dwarfs all of those things. And I remember uh, there was a quote by, from James Tobin, if I recall correctly. Uh, he said, how many Harburger triangles which for non-economists is this little measure in a graph of the microeconomic inefficiency, how many of them can you fit into an Oaken gap, which was named after Oaken, after Oaken, and that was the sort of loss of output per percentage rise in unemployment? And the answer, of course, is heaps. And uh, so, so it addresses that problem that, uh, that there's product workers are never in a non-productive situation. There were, and, uh, and one of the problems of unemployment, of course, is that workers uh, lose their, their, their... Slowly but surely, they become dislocated and they start losing their, their general skills and also their specific skills. And so these sort of job guarantee schemes stops all of that happening, provides steady income support, and most importantly, it fixes the minimum amount that the, that the deficit has to rise by when there's a downturn to stimulate employment. It's the, it, it sets a boundary because, because when do you know that the government's been, has spent enough? When the last worker has walked into the job guarantee office to pick up a job. Yeah, and, 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 and the point is, you know, the argument is, well, we don't want to give people free lunches. And of course, what I've always said about the job guarantee is, um, no, we, we want people to be able to pay for their lunches, and that's what the job guarantee yeah. actually does. So. Well, look, you know, uh, 
if you think about what we tolerate now, so let's go to Greece. We've got 60% of the, the 15 to 24-year-olds unemployed. That's your future generation of workers. They've now been unemployed, for some of them probably for six or seven years already. We've got unemployment rates all around the world of, you know, into double digits are at, in Europe. It's 10, you know, 10.8 or something at the moment, percent. That's a, that's a drastic waste of human potential. Even if you take a hard line and just worry about sort of economic things, e income losses, that's a dramatic daily loss of income that could be, could be produced. And then if you add, add the things that psychologists and health professionals and sociologists worry about, and that is mental health and uh, family breakdown and uh, rely alcohol and substance abuse and all of the other pathologies that are the personal and family and community pathologies that are outside just the loss of income. It's a dramatic loss. So any system <coughs> that was different to that would, you know, it doesn't take a genius to invent a system that would be better than that. Mm -hmm. And you know, for people who want to hang on to that system as if it's the you know the Tina, the, uh, the, there's no alternative. That's just untrue. Even if all of these job guarantee workers just turned up in the morning, dug a hole through the day, and, and uh, that you know an engineer could calibrate how long it would dig and then how long it would take to fill in again. Even if they just did that, it would be better than the system we've got now. But you know, our research has shown that there's there's a multitude of productive activities that can be done by that workforce that, that, are, that would be oriented to meeting unmet community and environmental care needs. And so it's not just a matter of digging holes and filling them in again, the old sort of boondoggle. It's a matter of political will, actually. And, um, you, you, one hopes that eventually that the uh, governments will see the wisdom of that approach. I mean, one of the things that modern monetary theory emphasises, at least the way I talk about it, uh, which reflects my background uh, and where I came into economics is that uh, the government always chooses the unemployment rate. You know, I do work in uh, in in less developed countries and as a development economist, and I'm always being met by bureaucrats and IMF type officials who who start off the meeting saying that unemployment this is a highly complex, multi-layered, you know, uh, deep problem. And I say, no, it's not. The government chooses the unemployment rate. You could employ all those people within about a week. Hopefully, more and more governments will start to see the wisdom of that, uh, that insight. Bill, uh, we've run out of time. But again, thanks very much for uh, taking the time to speak to me today. Really more appreciate than welcome. it. Mm.